Hi everyone, Mike Vinoy, Vice President of Marketing at Assure. And today we're gonna to talk about the Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act, some people will know it as Obamacare, uh, a law passed all the way back in 2010, requiring businesses of certain sizes uh, to provide health insurance to their employees. Uh, and as we come out of a pandemic, uh, there's gonna be a lot of people who now have to comply with this law that maybe for the last couple of years didn't because they didn't have the right number of employees that, uh, that this maybe didn't apply to them. Uh, so really important uh, is, is we, as we come out of the pandemic, people are hiring, especially summer season and seasonal work. How do we capture full-time employees who, who, who must comply, who, who, who won't? Uh, lots to understand around compliance with the Affordable Care Act. So uh, I've got a perfect guest for helping me unpack this today. Uh, regular uh, listeners and watchers of the show will know Brian Schenker uh, from uh, the from Jackson Lewis. Uh, uh, Brian is a practicing attorney, uh, extensive experience uh, helping uh, employers uh, uh, work through wage and hour audits, as well as litigation, uh, anything around HR issues. Brian, welcome to, the, to, to today's show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. As always, uh, another uh, interesting and uh, always timely topic is uh, the ACA. Yeah, you bet. You bet. And I think it's one of those things that so many people, uh, they think they know it, but the, there's uh, so much nuance to this law uh, that, that they don't, and especially growing companies, because you get lulled to sleep thinking this hasn't applied to me in the past. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, as they grow, especially coming out of a pandemic, uh, it could really catch you flat-footed if you don't know about it. Right. No, that's absolutely true. And and so, you know, we, we go back, like you said, this this loss was signed into effect in uh, 2010. And right at the time, it made sweeping changes to health insurance, uh, how it's procured, how it's paid for. Uh, you know, the purpose of the Affordable Care Act was to really uh, reduce the health insurance costs uh, to Americans uh, through this uh, shared responsibility of, you know, the government, uh, employers, and policyholders. Uh, and so, you know, right now we still have the, uh, the employer mandate, which is a lot of what we'll uh, discuss today, who's subject to it, what the requirements are, and, and all that good stuff. Uh, there was originally, obviously, a uh, individual mandate uh, for all, almost all individuals, to get health coverage. Uh, but uh, as uh, everyone should should really know, that was uh, done away with uh, several years back uh, when, when that part of the uh, of ACO was uh, repealed. Uh, but there are still some, you know, very key elements uh, to ACA that you know still uh, you know impact. You know, policyholders and employers, uh, just to name a, a couple, Mike would be right. These you know minimum essential coverage standards, you know, and how it relates to the employer mandate. Uh, you know, making subsidies available for lower income individuals, uh, enforcing mi minimum standards for health insurance policies, uh, and you know. A couple others will hit on these, but you know, 90 day maximum, uh, you know, waiting periods. Uh, so, you know, like I said, today we'll really focus on, you know, the substantive standards, the minimum essential coverage to be offered by large employers. Uh, but it's definitely something, like you said, that even if you uh, thought you were a small employer, you may have grown, you may now qualify as a uh, an applicable large employer. Uh, or, you know, even for small employers, those less than 50, we'll, we'll discuss, there still are some requirements uh, under the Act. And, and, and I'll just add this kind of caveat here, you know, just uh, uh, inevitably so many of these topics, Brian, that we cover around HR legislation, uh, you know, some have a really strong political component. And even more than a decade in uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act, this thing still has can be a bit polarizing as a political topic. You know, we are not leaning left, we're not leaning right, we are not advocating for or against this law. We are simply here to give you the best information we possibly can about what is in fact a law uh, that, that you must comply with. So uh, whether you love the ACA, whether you hate the ACA, whether you, whether you think uh, insurance should be fully uh, uh, managed by the state or totally by, uh, for, by the free market, uh, that's not what this, this discussion is about. This is just a factual unpacking of what the Affordable Care Act is 
and what employers must do and what they what they must know. So with that, let, Brian, let's just jump into it. Um, sure. uh, what is it that, that let's maybe start before we talk about all the all the nuance. You know, first, who does this apply to, and maybe more specifically, who does it not apply to? Sure. So right. So many of us are, like I said, familiar with this uh, employer mandate, and before we get into really necessarily what that is, right, it's a requirement for large employers, and those are employers with over 50 full-time employees or equivalents. Uh, but you know, if you're if you have less than that, or you think you do, you know, don't don't shut us off now. You you may in fact have over 50 full-time equivalents, and there, like I said earlier, there are other uh, re requirements as well. Uh, so. Basically, if, if you're an employer with over 50 full-time equivalents, uh, the requirement is that you offer you know, affordable uh, health coverage to employees, uh, and the insurance must also provide minimum value uh, to the employees and their dependents. Uh, and essentially, this is very high level, very, you know, very, very much a summary. You know, if an applicable large employer, an ALE, uh, does not provide such benefits uh, to employees, then it may need to pay a penalty to the IRS. Um, so, you know, essentially it gives full time, these large employers an option. You, you provide compliant insurance or you pay a penalty. And as we'll discuss later, you know, those penalties can be quite large. So quite often the answer is offering uh, compliant uh, coverage. Brian, you, can, you can tell me if I'm jumping ahead too much, because um, then we're going to talk more about the, the compliance requirements for employers. But can, can we get a little more nuanced in this 50? Can you can you can you tell us? Let's start first with you. You, you talked about full-time equivalents, and the concept of full-time equivalents, unfortunately, uh, has has different meanings based on different laws, right? So the Affordable Care Act versus say say uh, COBRA versus say getting your PPP loan uh, or, or an ERTC uh, 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 tax credit, right? Mm -hmm. So this gets really confusing. Can you speak specifically to FTE requirements to, to for this 50 employee threshold as it relates to ACA? Absolutely, so let, let's break that down. So how, how do you know if you're an applicable large employer with those 50 full-time or full-time equivalents? Uh, so the, the first step is, you know, count your full-time employees. Uh, so how do we do that? For for each month of the last calendar year, uh, determine the, which employees worked at least 130 hours in that month. Those are your full-time employees. Uh, so essentially that's any employee who works over, you know, 30 or more hours in a week uh, is gonna be a full-time employee. Then it comes to your full-time equivalents, right? So now you need to calculate those. So for each month, again, we're going to look at the last calendar year. We're going to look at, uh, you know, all those part-time employees. We're going to add up all the hours for the uh, the non-full-time employees. So for, for the part-time employees, uh, up to a maximum of 120 hours uh, per month per employee. So if, if they worked over 120, but they're part-time, just uh, leave it at 20, 120. And then, then you divide the total of all those uh, part-time hours by 120, and those are your full-time equivalents uh, for each month. Uh, and then very simply, you, you add up your full-time employees and your full-time equivalents uh, for all 12 months, and then determine the monthly average. Uh, and so companies then with a monthly average of 50 or more, uh, they will be uh, considered a uh, an applicable large employer, an ALE, uh, and subject to the requirements of the employer mandate, uh, as well as potential penalties. Um, so if I, if I can break that down a little bit, uh, Brian. So if if because you, you mentioned a hundred, so I want to explore two concepts. One is seasonality. Another is turnover. So you mentioned employees who work more than 130 hours a month, right? Um, if I have, say, 50, let's say I have 51 human beings that work for me. Um, let's say I have 49 human beings that work for me that, uh, 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 that, have, that on average work more than 130 hours a month, uh, but I have some turnover. So I might, at the end of the year, I might have 52 or 53 employees who uh, 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 
uh, worked over the 130 hours. How, how do I, how do I count that to account for turnover to determine what my average is? Yeah. And so great question. And I think that's where, you know, we're doing it on, you know, on a monthly average, right? So you want to determine it on, on a monthly average. Uh, and, and then you're going to, you know, figure out if, if your average is then above or, or below 50. So that's why, you know, it's not just a yearly calculation. It's, it's going to be done monthly. And um, I think going to your next question, when you address seasonality, and I know you mentioned it, and I, I think we even uh, touched upon, you know, seasonality in our, our uh, last discussion a, a week or two ago. Yeah. Uh, is that there, there is an exception under ACA for seasonal workers because right we're, we're now getting into that time of the year where uh, a lot of payrolls will fluctuate upwards uh, for you know uh, reasons of you know seasonal employment so yeah. you know if you have seasonal workers uh, you still might not be a large employer even if you uh, employ more than uh, than 50 uh, full-time workers so uh what we're really looking at is whether uh the the, the company employs more than 50 full-time employees for 120 days or fewer right so if if those 120 days or fewer right that's essentially uh four months uh during the calendar year if, if those in excess of 50 right are the uh seasonal workers then a company won't necessarily hit the uh, uh, hit the threshold. Uh, but if their you know non-seasonal workforce uh, hits gets them above 50, or if those seasonal workers are seasonal in a non-ACA sense and they, they might be working you know more than four months a year, uh, then then you might be hitting uh, you know 50 full-time employees or equivalents you know beyond those 120 days. Uh, so there are some intricacies here to pay attention to that you know you can look at to either ensure you're falling below that that 50 or that you know if, if you're not careful uh, might result in a company being above that uh, that 50 employee threshold. Brian, what what about multi-location businesses? So I'm, if I'm a franchise owner, maybe I maybe I own a bunch of a uh, 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 bunch of Burger Kings, right. um, and I have each location set up as its own tax identity, its own its own yeah, FEIN the tax uh, number, right? So they're each their own LLC, they're each their own tax ID, so they're separate companies, but there's mutual beneficial ownership because I own all of them. Uh, how, does, how does location and or uh, uh, legal entity status versus in, with relationship to mutual beneficial ownership, how, how does all that interplay with employee counts in, right. and over 50? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And you know, a way that you know, some companies may, may you know, think they can get around the requirements. Uh, generally, uh companies with you know or you know organizations with several companies or entities within a single control group are likely going to be considered uh, uh an aggregate an aggregated applicable large employer so uh they, they very well may still hit the uh hit the 50 person threshold uh to be an ALE and if they are there are some additional uh reporting requirements uh we'll get into what the normal ones are a, a bit later but uh there there is some more information that uh a uh, an aggregated uh large employer may have to file with the IRS to you know explain the various entities and such uh so yeah that's something very important to understand that you know, multiple locations, multiple uh, companies uh, within common control. Uh, you know, you, you got to look at that and um, you know see if you're you're hitting the the threshold there. And Brent, I'm not trying to take us down too much too dangerous a rabbit hole here, but is it is it safe to say that there are some instances where you know, like uh, our friend Mary Simmons always says, you can't legislate, you 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 can't create policy around legislation, right? Um, so you, you can't usurp the law here, but is it safe to say that, uh, I don't know if it is or not, it, it, 
could it, could the franchisor of a bunch of Burger Kings disaggregate uh, all their locations so that each one is under 50 and therefore not have to comply? Or is it likely that they would have to be treated as an aggregation, uh, an aggregated single uh, uh, company versus if I owned two businesses, I own, uh, own a, a small retail shop, but I also own a tool and die shop, completely unrelated. Would, would I have to commingle those into single ownership? Can you can you put some color around that or at least what your right. guidance to employers would be listening yeah, to that? So, yeah, a great question. And, and again, I, I think, a lot, you know, planning should go into this. There's, you know, possibilities of uh, avoiding that uh, single control group uh, depending on, uh, you know, a, a number of factors. So, you know, that's something where, um, you know, I, I really think, you know, ACA, and everything we talk about, you know, today, uh, I think as, you know, people will see that there should be some proactive planning that goes into this, not necessarily just say, hey, this is my business and, oh, now I have to figure out what I need to do. I, you know, there can absolutely be planning here, you know, at the end of the, at the beginning of each year, or, you know, as we get towards the end of the plan year for, for the next year uh, to, to determine, you know, how you can best, uh, you know, benefit your business, benefit your employees. Uh, and, and so there are a number of ways to, to, to work around that. Yeah, okay. All right. And, and <laughs> I'll be careful. We're not advocating that you try to sneak around avoiding the law, but it's fair to say there are circumstances within the law that you may not have to aggregate uh, in, 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 uh, the, the beneficial interest. Is that, am I saying Absolutely. that correctly? Absolutely, we're we're not we're, we're not recommending anyone uh, uh, work around the law. I, I, the workarounds were you know kind of what I mentioned. Uh, uh, that there are various ways to measure things, do certain things, whether it's something about the uh, you know control group or, or other aspects. Safe harbors we'll discuss. Uh, there are various options for employers. It's not necessarily a one size fit all uh, fits all law. So there there are ways. Uh, you know, companies can can do things, uh, you know, depending on their circumstances. Okay, very good. All right, so I, th I think we covered this. So roughly, it's the line is at 50 employees, and there's a bunch of nuance around how you count 50 employees, multiple locations, seasonality, turnover. But basically, if you add up your full-time employees and your full-time equivalents, uh, and if that number is greater than 50, then you must comply with the Affordable Care Act. It's, I think. It's. I, I think we. I think we cover a lot of ground for maybe a, a bunch of edge cases, but most businesses are going to fall into this pretty simple math. Would you agree? Agreed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Simple math, not necessarily simple to get the data to do that simple math. We'll explore that later. But let, let's talk more details about what some of the actual. So, if you're if you're a business who now qualifies, you must comply. What are some of the things that you must do with compliance? Sure. So if you're, uh, you've got 50 or more full-time uh, employees or equivalents, uh, you're now uh, an applicable large employer. So as a large employer, uh, you know, under what's known as the employer mandate, uh, you're required to offer health insurance to at least 95% of your full-time workers. That's both affordable and provides minimum value, uh, or else there, there could be penalties. Uh, so the affordable part and the minimum value are, are the two big ticket items that, that we'll discuss. Uh, and those are, you know, to the main focus, right? That the cost of health coverage, which is the affordability factor, and the sufficiency of, of the covered, you know, coverage. What's covered, um, you know, that's the minimum value that it needs to provide. Uh, so, you know, what ALEs are really trying to avoid here is the penalty for having you know, any employee qualify for uh, the, the premium tax credit to employees. Um, you know, that's a, a monthly assistance amount uh, for health insurance uh, provided to an individual. Uh, and the company, as we'll get to later, you know, when we talk about penalties, you know, there are penalties, substantial ones, if an employee, even a single employee, uh, receives the uh, the premium tax credit. Um, so the idea is that as an employer, you don't want people to qualify for that. So 
uh, and they won't if the employer offers or you know makes eligible uh, people eligible for a plan with minimum essential coverage uh, in any month in which they're they're, they're qualified. Um, so you know we'll we'll break those down. And so I, I guess you know Mike, starting with the affordable you know coverage, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know that's uh, you know one would think it's it's quite simple, but you know, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, the way ACA works is, you know, it, it explains what affordable coverage is. We, and then, you know, I'll explain what that is. And then, then it provides various types of uh, safe harbors. Uh, and those safe harbors are things that if your plan would qualify under those safe harbors, then it would be considered uh, affordable and uh, compliant with, with this aspect of ACA. Um, yeah, let's let's just start with a uh, the the legal definition of affordable because that sounds like a pretty loosey goosey word. <laughs> right, right. So a plan is affordable if the employee contributions uh, for uh, an employee coverage uh, plan does not exceed a certain percentage of an employee's household income. Uh, and so for 2022, I believe that is. Uh, it dipped down from last year. Uh, it's I think 9.61 percent of the employee's household income this year it was something around 9.8 percent last year. Uh, there's a slight uh, decrease this year, uh, and you know that's actually relevant because uh, a plan that was affordable last year uh, because it could have gone up to 9.8. Uh, percent of the uh, household income can only hit 9.61 percent this year. So uh, that means, you know, even if you had an affordable plan in 2021, you need to ensure that that same plan is now affordable in, in uh, 2022. Uh, so, you know, the next question is right. So how do how do you know how do you know if you're offering uh, a, an affordable plan uh, because the idea here is it's measured as a percentage of household income and most, if not all employers uh, have little to no idea what their employees uh, household income is. Uh, right. right. So, you know, fortunately, you know, ACA has uh, created these uh, uh, measurements, the safe harbors, uh, so that, you know, if the company meets any of those safe harbors, uh, the, the plan is deemed affordable. Um, so, you know, the, the first is, oh, again, you know, the, the three safe harbors, um, you know, the selection, you know, we'll, we'll get into that, but selection of which safe harbor is really uh, dependent on characteristics of the employer and the workforce. Uh, and this is what I said is, you know, no, no one size fits all for, you know, a certain employer in a certain circumstance. Uh, you know, the, the federal poverty level safe harbor might work best. Uh, for another, the rate of pay safe harbor. And for another company, it might be uh, the Form W-2 safe harbor. Um, so, you know, you, you need to make sure you understand, you know, which of the safe harbors uh, works out most beneficially to your, uh, to your entity. Uh, so, you know, go, going through those, uh, as I said, you know, the federal poverty level, that, that's the, uh, the first safe harbor, you know, we can discuss. And that uses, it's, it's probably the most simple safe harbor to use because uh, the company really doesn't need any data uh, beyond what that year's uh, federal, uh, federal poverty level is. Uh, so basically, uh, we take the uh, federal poverty level and we multiply it by the affordability uh, figure of 9.61%. Uh, and so I, I believe this year the uh, the affordability, uh, the federal poverty level is around uh, 13,500 or so. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, you know, applying the 9.61%, again, it's, it's hard to remember all the numbers. I believe that brings us to a figure of a, a little above $100 a month. Uh, so that would mean that a plan uh, that was affordable under this safe harbor you know, could only charge up to uh, that hundred dollars or a little over a hundred dollars per month. Okay. Um, so 
you know, this is the easiest one, right? It doesn't, there's no factor that involves the actual employer. It's just the federal, federal poverty level. Uh, you know, again, you need to pay attention because this level will change each year. Uh, but again, it, it's pretty foolproof. This is a tough one to, uh, uh, to uh, screw up with the calculation. Uh, but again, uh, I would say this is probably the, uh, the most conservative method uh, in terms of a safe harbor, uh, using either the, the rate of pay or the W-2 safe harbor uh, that we'll discuss will probably result in the company being able to charge the employer uh, employees a little bit more uh, per so month Brian, for coverage. So Brian, if I can kind of back it up here. So this is getting real complex real fast, and, and <laughs> this is why we unpack this, right? So if I'm an employer that, that I, so I cross the 50 employee threshold, I must comply with the ACA, uh, uh, it, it we'll talk about filing requirements in, in a bit, uh, but I, the cost of the health plan that I provide to my employee cannot exceed that year's minimum of their household, and there are safe harbors to apply here. So uh, currently this year is 9.61%, so theoretically I the employee contribution to the health insurance that I'm providing as an employer could not exceed 9.61% of my annual pay, uh, uh, my annual household income. And because the employer does not know what it, the household income is for all their employees, you apply these safe harbor rules. The safest, most conservative, of which is the minimum, the poverty line, something around $13,000, which basically means the most conservative thing you could do if you have to comply is your employees not pay more than about a hundred bucks a month for health insurance. Am I saying that correctly? Absolutely right. Uh, maybe now maybe I didn't make it sound this clear, but you, but you did. <laughs> so thank you. Now, now the hard thing there, if you're an employer, is coming up with actual competitive health plans that only cost the employee a hundred dollars a month, and you don't go broke. I mean, that, that just to be blunt, right? That's that's the most conservative calculation method you could follow as an employer, but it also from a from a budget standpoint, that if you're going to uh, provide, uh, and I know we're going to talk about not just uh, affordable, but the value component in, in a second here, it may be really, really difficult to provide a good plan that only requires $100 a month for the employee for, say, a family plan that doesn't cost you as an employer a ton of money. Am I thinking about that right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And so, right, I think it's two competing parts that we're looking at, right? You, right, talking about being competitive and wanting to have a competitive benefits package, right? So you want to balance, right, what the employees are going to have to pay, along with having a meaningful, uh, you know, and, and solid plan uh, choice for uh, for the employees. Um, yeah. So, so right, so and right, using the uh, the federal poverty level safe harbor, you know, will again, presuming you can find, uh, you know, a plan with minimum value at that um, at that amount, you know, that would be, you know, the the least you could uh, probably result in the you know the lowest amount that you would uh, be uh, charging employees. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and, and then, you know, moving on to the, the second one, the rate of pay safe harbor. Uh, quite self-explanatory here. Uh, the rate of pay safe harbor uses an employee's hourly rate of pay or monthly salary to establish uh, what affordability is. Uh, so with respect to hourly employees, uh, you know, premiums cannot be more than 9.61% of their uh, the monthly uh, rate of pay. So this is calculated using the lower hourly rate for the month, um, either at you know the beginning of the month or or the coverage period, whatever is lowest. And then uh, you know we multiply that by uh, 130 hours. So even if they don't work 130 hours, we're going to multiply that rate by 130 hours uh, mm -hmm. to figure out what the 9.61% uh, of that comes to. So that raises the floor. So presumably, that raises the floor from the national poverty level, but it also kind of sort of assumes that uh, your employee is the sole income provider for the household. Is that 
fair? Right. It does that because, right, because the, the law recognizes that, you know, having any measurement tied to what the actual actual family earns is not quite possible. So in with this safe harbor, it says, all right, we're just going to look at the rate of pay, uh, you know, the, that lowest rate of pay. And based on that, if if you're having employees pay less than, uh, you know, 9.61% uh, of that rate times 130 hours, that then you're going to have satisfied affordability. Um, you know, one might say it's a fiction because, right, it has nothing actually to do with what that uh, household uh, income is. Uh, but that's exactly the point here, that the IRS has given employers uh, ways to measure affordability in actual ways that are doable. Uh, and I, don't so, I don't know how many more there are, but are there other uh, less conservative uh, ways that could account for uh, other safe harbors that could account for additional household income? Absolutely. So the the form W two that's uh, that one in my experience typically comes up with the uh, the highest number. I mean, it, it might be comparable to the. Uh, the rate of pay safe harbor, but uh, I, I think that it'll often be be higher. Uh, so just real briefly, and again, pretty self-explanatory, uh, the, the W-2 safe harbor uses the information from the employee's W-2 to, to determine affordability. Uh, yeah. So again, it's, we're still gonna use that 9.61%, and here we're going to, uh, take 9.61% of, uh, I believe it's box one on the W-2 form. Uh, so that's going to basically be their their yearly wages for the prior year. And we'll look to see if uh, you know uh, it's affordable based on that. Now, keep in mind that box one on the W-2 doesn't include some uh, income. It's, it's reduced by you know, pre-tax deductions such as uh, you know, 401k, uh, or other you know benefits contributions, um, but you know just to give an example of this, right? So we, we take an employee with uh, say something like you know thir you know thirty thousand uh, dollars in wages uh, on the W two, and we multiply that by you know nine point six percent. I think that brings us out to something around uh, three thousand. Uh, for the year, and uh, I think it's a little under 250 per month. So I mean, that's what well, I think that's about 150 more or so than the original, the federal uh, poverty level. So um, you know, this the uh, you know the W-2 measurement uh, you know can often is often a good one for employers with lots of uh, you know full-time employees who are working over 30 hours a week. Uh, or are salaried and you know working consistent hours, um, you know. So this can be a good one as it definitely gives us a higher. Uh, often will give us a higher number. All right, and I, are, are there more that you think our audience should know about? Because we're getting really wonky here. You know, there's yep. a bunch of other compliance requirements that I want to get to yet in the, in this hour specifically around reporting requirements. Is there anything yep. else? Yeah, we, we can move. We can we can move on on from there. I, I think that's uh, again any 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 part of ACO we can go down a rabbit hole on, uh, you know, and talk about you know uh, you know any of these topics for for a few hours and and might cause more confusion. But yeah, I think uh, those are really the, the safe harbors we're looking at. Um, so, so I think it's safe to say that if you're looking as if you're an employer looking for the simplest, easiest. And I think uh, richest plan to your employees, because it might require you as an employer to contribute more, would be uh, the poverty, national poverty level uh, safe harbor. But um, if you're wanting to get to, to, to tie back to what you actually pay this employee, and I'd say maybe it's also fairly simple, you're just pulling it off the W-2, uh, would be the W-2 safe harbors, which is probably the much more common approach. It, 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 would you agree with that, Brian? Yes, I, I would agree. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's move on to uh, uh, to I think uh, minimum value. Sure, sure. So right, so that's the second aspect of uh, what uh, a, you know, an applicable large employer needs to provide in, in terms of coverage. Right, they need to provide um, you know affordable care and care that a plan that provides minimal value, minimum value. So 
this is basically a standard for measuring uh, insurance plans to make sure it provides at least the, the minimum amount of coverage uh, for purposes of ACA. Uh, and so, you know, the general guidance so it doesn't really explain much or tell us how to, you know, figure out if your plan is uh, providing minimum value, but it needs to cover at least 60% uh, of uh, the, the total cost of allowed benefits uh, that, that are incurred or expected to be incurred. Uh, there's also a requirement that it provides uh, coverage uh, or substantial coverage for uh, you know, physician and inpatient hospitalization services. Uh, but again, that doesn't explain what a, what a minimum value plan is. So you know, practically speaking, what's that mean? So you know, any of the, uh, the metallic tiers, I, I guess we'll call them, uh, you know, generally will meet minimum value. So that's you know, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, those types of plans uh, should meet minimum value standards. Uh, if your plan doesn't meet those you know, metallic level requirements, then you need to do a bit more uh, due diligence in calculating on your own to see if your plan uh, is compliant. And it, there's an easy way to do this. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has a minimum value calculator. Uh, so I would implore anyone who wants to uh, ensure uh, minimum value to, to simply use that uh, that calculator it requires some uh, uh, some simple information about your plan to put into the calculator, and it'll tell you uh, whether your plan provides minimum value. Um, and so, again, you know, what what if your plan uh, you know does not provide minimum value? You know, what do you do? Um, well, again, as we'll discuss, you'll potentially be hit with uh, you know a penalty. Um, and so you need to, you know, take a look at your plan and make sure that you are offering something, you know, that that does provide uh, that minimum value. Brian, so uh, obviously as an attorney, you come from come at this from a legal perspective. What are the legal requirements for compliance? Uh, uh, and how do you help clients who, 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 you know, get in trouble here? Um, but safe to say, you know, you're, if as an employer, you're not personally buying insurance directly from Blue Cross Blue Shield, you're 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 going through some type of a, a, of, a of a broker, right? And uh, my experience, I'd be curious for your opinion. My, my experience is your insurance broker is really going to be able to help you craft these plans because this is a lot to know, uh, and it and because these rates change and it's down to the hundredth percent, uh, right. these things change every single year. Um, your insurance broker should really be able to guide you through this to to make sure that you are offering in fact uh the minimum minimum value compliant plans uh plans you know must comply with certain standards set forth by the affordable care act is that yeah. is that accurate yeah i absolutely agree this should be uh you know a question you would have for your broker or you know whomever else is you know helping you uh, obtain uh, you know, a plan for, for the company. And yeah, just, you know, this should be something, you know, I, I mean, you know, you, you should be able to ask the broker, you know, does this provide minimum uh, value and they should be able to tell you yes or no. But again, um, you know, as, as the employer, you're going to be the one on the hook for it at the end of the day, if you don't provide minimum value. So, um, you know, right, just like you can rely on you know, an attorney for all your, you know, wage and hour advice, you know, because there can be complications there. It's good to have some baseline understanding uh, of that as well. Um, so I think that, yeah, absolutely, there, there should be guidance available. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, these shouldn't be foreign terms uh, to an employer. I think this is complex enough that if you had to do it by yourself, you should be a little scared as an employer. Uh, but there's Probably. help out in the broker world. There are areas where you should be scared as an employer because it's complex. And I think one of them is uh, reporting requirements, what you must do. And then we'll talk about, uh, you know, the penalties associated with the, with non-compliance in, in a second. So let's, let's take, take us into reporting requirements, Brian. Sure. So uh, when we're talking about reporting requirements, the, the main form we're talking about is this form uh, uh, 1095C. Uh, and 
that these are basically tax forms that uh, you're going to file under ACA with uh, the IRS each year. Um, as to uh, health coverage, so basically the idea is that reporting relate, you know, relates to health coverage in the prior calendar year and it's due, you know, early the next calendar year. So for coverage provided in 2021, uh, the ACA deadlines, you know, range from uh, February 28th, uh, I think if uh, if paper filing up to uh, March 31st, if uh, if electronically filing. Uh, and so, you know, what what is this uh, 1095C form? So basically, uh, you know, as we know, ACA requires you know the large employers to offer you know their full-time employees qualifying health coverage. Uh, and so it follows that those large employers are required to report, uh, you know, certain health insurance information to the IRS, uh, and that includes a 1095. And there's a 1094C. That's pretty much just a summary of the company's uh, 1095 forms. Uh, and so this helps the IRS determine, you know, whether employees were eligible for subsidies. Uh, and therefore, whether there you know could be any penalties for the employer in that year. Um, so again, like I said, the deadlines are early in the year, uh, and the, the deadlines depend on whether you're filing paper or electronic. And my advice here would be to file electronically, all things you know being equal, because you get a later deadline. Uh, if if you're filing uh, electronically, you have a March 31st deadline. Uh, instead of uh, you know February 28th as it was this year, um, so you know there are also deadlines uh, you know for um, for state reporting. There are some states that still require um, some ACA related uh, state filings, which are similar but not identical to what's filed federally. Um, just the number of the uh, California, uh, Massachusetts, uh, the District of Columbia, to name a couple. Uh, so, you know, pay attention if there are separate state uh, deadlines for filing the, uh, the 1095s or related forms uh, in your jurisdiction. Brian, I mean, th th this might be silly, but the, the way I think about this is since most, most employers elect the W-2 safe harbor, Think about you got your year-end processes, you're running payroll, you're churning up your books, and you got to the end of January to get your W-2s out. And because W-2s is the safe harbor test method you're using for ACA, it's a month later. Basically, you got to have your ACA filing done. Is that right? Yeah, basically a month later. I think in uh, what was it this year or last year that the the, uh, they, they, the IRS provided a 30-day uh, extension. Uh, to that February date, so that's why I think it's now March 31st, and going forward, it'll stay that way. But, but yeah, this this is one of those early year reporting requirements, certainly. Yeah, yeah, and, just, and uh, the only reason I recap it that way is um, it's not just that it's an early year reporting, just like you're doing your taxes, you're reporting on the prior year. So you got you're you're, you're reporting your your taxes from prior year. You're getting W-2s in the hands of employees. Uh, end of January from prior year, using those those W-2s become the safe harbor test for your ACA, uh, your 1095C filings from prior year. Uh, so just just so people can kind of uh, uh, businesses employers can think about the the sequences sequencing of how these things play out. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you know, in, in addition to those filings. You know there there are notices too that, uh, under ACA that need to be uh, given out to employees uh, either you know talking about at the outset of employment uh, or uh, depending on certain triggers. Um, and so you some, say no, say more say more what you mean by that. Sure. So I think the first one we have the, the notice of marketplace coverage options. Uh, that that's a written notice that goes to employees that basically tells them about the health insurance marketplace for for individuals. Uh, that's it's that's provided within I believe it's 14 days of uh, their start of employment. It's not an annual form. It's just you know that one time 
Uh, and you know, you can look to the DOL, the D, uh, Department of Labor has uh, template notices, uh, and there's one template for those who offer insurance, one for those who don't offer, uh, because this notice requirement uh, is actually for both large and small employers. So the notice of marketplace coverage options, you know, whether or not you're a large employer, so whether you have you know, five employees or 100 employees, this is a notice that, uh, that you should be providing uh, you know, at the outset of employment uh, for individuals. And it explains what open enrollment is, uh, circumstances you know, when the, the employee might be eligible for a tax credit, uh, things like that. So uh, again, DOL has a template, probably you know a broker can you know provide you a template but again it's on the employer to you know provide this notice yeah i think a lot um, of us uh, are these things get done for you on your on your behalf by say your broker and you don't even realize it uh so but be really really cautious if you're switching brokers switching platforms switching carriers it is still your legal obligation as the employer to 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 provide the notice right Exactly, exactly. And, and the same probably goes with the summary of benefits coverage, right? Yeah. Uh, many, many health pro care providers will, pro will you know, provide this to the company or provide this to your broker. Um, and, you know, the summary of benefits coverage is, is what it sounds like. It provides uh, the employees with, you know, the standard information uh, about their medical plans. So, you know, they can compare it to others choose which plan uh and so the uh I, we call it the sbc the summary of uh benefits coverage the sbd's uh bc is provided when an individual enrolls you know for the first time in coverage uh at the beginning of each plan year uh or uh within seven i believe seven days of a uh an individual requesting a copy of it uh and this can be provided uh in electric uh, electronic uh, or paper, uh, or it can also be posted on the website. Some larger employers uh, will post this on the internet, uh, and as long as you're providing sufficient information to employees as to how they can access it, uh, you know that's that's sufficient. And you know, there's a whole bunch of information that goes into this. I'm not, I'm not going to go through that now. It's a standard form. Uh, and uh, again, you know, it should re reflect the information in, in your plan. Okay. Uh, uh, and then following that, there's also a notice of material uh, modification. Again, pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but uh, you know, the ACA requires employers to provide this notice uh, to plan participants uh, 60 days before making any material modifications to their uh, health plan. Um, Can you give an example of what a material modification might look like? Yeah, gr great question. So it includes anything that, you know, I, I believe the, uh, the definition is uh, anything that an average uh, participant would believe, think is an important change in covered benefits. But uh, I mean, there are basically uh, a couple of circumstances this arises in whether when there's an enhancement of, uh, of covered benefits or services, uh, or when there's a reduction, um, such as you know, uh, reducing benefits or you know, an increase in the amount uh, in the employee's uh, cost uh, for the coverage, you know, those would certainly be things. And, and again, this is a you're giving this out 60 days before a change. Uh, and that's important because, that, as we'll discuss, you know, there are penalties for failure to do that. Um, so this is something that, you know, if, if you're planning on making changes, you know, mid-year to a policy, uh, you know, plan in advance and make sure that you're providing you know, sufficient notice before the changes actually uh, take effect. Okay. Um, and so I believe, you know, those are generally the uh, the notice, the distribution requirements uh, under ACCA. Uh, I think that that generally covers, you know, what the what you know employers of you know both sizes may sometimes need to uh, to provide. So there's obviously a lot. I mean, this is a, I don't know how many thousand page bill. So there's there's a, there's a lot of nuance that we're not, we can't cover in an hour. But basically, 
uh, add up your uh, full-time employees to your full-time equivalents, and if you aggregate over 50 employees, you must comply. If you do, you got a couple of tests. You've got a, uh, it's got to be affordable, and there are certain tests and safe harbors for affordability, usually most commonly tied back to W-2. Um, and there's also a minimum benefit, uh, minimum value requirement must be met. Your insurance broker can probably help you with that. Um, every, uh, uh, you know, February, March, you got to file your 1095Cs uh to uh, uh, provide the underpinning detail uh of your compliance or <laughs> exposing your non-compliance uh, uh to the federal agencies and then uh, some of these uh notices material changes uh uh uh, 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 uh marketplace coverage options etc that uh, that you must comply with you, I, I think we don't have to go probably deeper on the notices just because I think most people are going to get assistance from their insurance brokers in, theirs, uh, in that area. Be, before we talk, to kind of jump the last couple of minutes here to talk about consequence of non-compliance, anything else you think employers need to know, Brian, around compliance requirements? Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll just briefly mention a couple things, but I, you're right. I, I'd say nothing to dig into right now because, you know, the, again, you know, th these would all be, you know, uh, pretty uh, intensive, uh, you know, tangents. But um, again, so uh, requirements for you know employers of all sizes, really. So you know whether you're a small employer or a large employer, if you're offering health insurance. So I mean, obviously, small employers with under 50 full-time equivalents can still offer health insurance. Uh, absolutely. Sure. Um, and you know there are you know W two uh you know health require health require insurance you know coverage information that needs to be reported uh depending on the size of the company so again this doesn't mean coverage is taxable because it's going on a w-2 that is just where you know the irs is requiring it to be uh reported um and yeah i think you know there, there's some other you know smaller issues that uh that apply you know there's uh you know, companies may get, employers might get medical loss re, uh, ratio rebates, MLRs. Uh, we don't need to, you know, it, these are essentially rebates that, you know, you'll get from a uh, the health insurance company. And I think the, the, the key here is, without going into it too much, is if an employer gets one, number one, you, you need to do something with it within 90 days because, uh, oftentimes, uh, some portion or all of the rebate uh, will be a plan asset, which means that if a company holds on to it for more than 90 days, they likely need to put it into a trust uh, for the plan. So it just creates lots of problems. Um, and you know, the company also needs to decide how to distribute it. The, the, the employer might be able to use some or all of it to, you know, uh, in, increase the benefits uh they can also pass the rebate along to employees so just something to keep an eye on uh if that's uh something that that your company receives uh you know it's not just a check to deposit and keep uh that there are some requirements there okay okay um maybe conversation for another day we'll talk about the minimum you know employer shared responsibility components uh, uh, as well, but I think for sake of time, let, let, let's move on to non-compliance. Uh, and again, here, we're not literally just trying to scare people, but this stuff is very, very serious uh, for non-compliance. And it's not, it's not like, hey, you're gonna get a, 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 a you know, a, a late fee from the library for not filing uh, on time, there's that. But if you're not in compliance with the law, so you file your 1095C and it turned out you're out of compliance and the way you implement and execute the plan, uh, some of these fees can be very hefty. Can you kind of take us through this? Yeah, so, and I can tell you, you know, from personal experience, you know, we'll go through this and it'll become painfully obvious, I think, that a small error here can result in substantial liability uh, because we're not uh, the way these uh, rules work is not uh, not simply just looking at you know how many times something was violated or how many employees it affected. There there's some aspects to this where 
if there's one violation, one employee getting uh, the premium tax credit, then there's a per employee penalty, no matter how many uh, people are actually affected. Uh, so, you know, I can tell you, I, I've seen, you know, small errors, you know, result in uh, sick, you know, easily result in six figure you know, liability for a, a company that, you know, isn't even that large. We're not talking about a company with, you know, hundreds or thousands of employees. Uh, it, regardless, it's pretty, pretty easy for these penalties to, uh, to, to creep up on. So, so, uh, so we are talking earlier, you, you kind of hit four of them, right? So one of the first is a failure to distribute SBC. What, what is SBC and what's the fine? Sure, sure. So, you know, the, the failure to provide summary of uh, benefits coverage, that's that, uh, you know, the, the notice that you're going to uh, give out uh, regarding the plan. Um, you know, in 2022, I believe we're above uh, 1,200 on that. Uh, 1,250 or 60, I believe, per failure. Uh, so again, you know, that's one where just one notice, you know, is going, you know, not giving that to, you know, 50 employees, you're gonna have, uh, you know, liability, uh, you know, higher than 50,000. Um, and I, similar- I, I, I'll let that sink in for folks, because yeah. again, we're not gonna scare people, but let's say you try to go really cheap here, and however you're buying your insurance, your group health insurance uh, for your employees and trying to pinch every penny you can because it's darn expensive and your business is you know struggling coming out of, out of a pandemic, we understand. Uh, but that one mistake of not providing benefit, summary benefit coverage, the SBC, is a notice to, to employees. If you have 50 employees, there's your 50, 60 grand right there. And yeah. surely the business who is trying to save some money uh, and went a path that didn't get the notices out, didn't say more than 50, 60 grand. So uh, right. hugely, hugely uh, important. Let, let's move on to the, to the next one about notices of material uh, modifications. Right, so yes, yeah, similar penalty. I believe there's even a, uh, a per day uh, violation there of uh, a little over a hundred dollars. Right. So again, you know, that's a huge one. That's the, that's the notice that you're giving out uh 60 days before a uh you know a, a change is in, in place so again just those two notice penalties uh could be disastrous to an employer so you know that's why you, you may rely on your uh you know broker or per, uh healthcare provider to give you information and guidance on these things but when it comes down to it it is you know the employer's money that is going to be paying uh these penalties so uh, it, it would behoove any, you know, uh, diligent employer to, you know, understand, you know, where these uh, penalties for non-compliance can come in, uh, because regardless of whether it's your fault or the the broker's fault, it, it can be a substantial, uh, substantial amount. In in the IRS is going to hold you, the employer, accountable, not your broker. So exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, how about yeah. the uh, how about the two litmus tests we talked about around uh, affordability and value? Right. So those are the penalties. Uh, they come under uh, section four nine forty nine eighty uh, H. And so these are minimum essential coverage, uh, you know, penalties. And so there there are two parts to this. Um, so. They, they may seem a little similar. I'll, I'll try to break it down clearly. So under section A, employers are subject to a penalty if they fail to offer 95% of their full-time employees and dependents uh, a chance to enroll in minimum essential coverage plan, uh, or if any single employee enrolls in a public market plan, place plan that qualifies for the tax credit. Uh, so this is often the penalty when you know an employer who's an applicable large employer simply you know is not offering uh, coverage, um, and this again a large penalty. It's it's uh, 2,700 I think 2,750 per employee, which is uh, over $200 a month per employee. Uh, if they fail to offer, you know, that that minimal essential coverage to 95% of their their full-time employees, uh, when this when this penalty is triggered, uh, I believe there's uh, kind of a uh, 
uh, a safety net for employees that employers, I think it takes, it, it reduces the penalty by 30 full-time employees uh, to start out. Uh, so for instance, if, if an employer did not offer uh, coverage to, you know, it has 100 employees, it would only be penalized for, you know, 70 of those, the first 30 come out. Um, so that, that, that's something. Brandon, yep. This is this is retroactive, right? So like you, 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 you put the plan together, you work with your broker, however you put your plan together, you, uh, you file your 1095C, and this is the result. Do I have it right that this is the result of the IRS's inspection of that tax return? that you could then retroactively be fined these dollars? Exactly, it's basically going to play out like many, you know, IRS, uh, you know, tax uh, issues where, yeah, they're going to be looking at a past year. I, I, I'm not sure what year uh, they're, they're up to right now, but there's definitely, you know, a backlog where they're looking at past years. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, basically all the reporting requirements are giving the IRS the information it needs to determine right whether there was you know any coverage provided which would you know really be under the section A or as we'll get to next whether you know coverage was provided um, but it, it, it wasn't affordable or uh, or uh, you know meet the minimum value that that comes under section B um, and so I guess just going straight there um yeah. you know under section b right that's going to be employers will trigger this uh for not providing employees with a plan that meets the minimum value and affordable uh, aspects that that we uh discussed uh before um and and if any employee then enrolls in a you know a marketplace plan you know qualifying for a tax credit that then it gets triggered uh, so the, the main, so the penalty under this section is a bit more uh, than Section A. This is uh, a little over 4000 annually uh, and comes to uh, something around $340 uh, per, per month uh, per employee. Um, and so this penalty under Section B will occur if, you know, the employer offers coverage, but it doesn't meet affordability or minimum value. Um, now, as opposed to the first uh, penalty we discussed under Section A, this does not apply to all employees. So, right, whereas the first penalty we were talking about, you know, if you have 100, you're going to be penalized for 100, you know, minus the 30. Uh, this one, uh, Section B, only uh, penalizes the employer for affected employees. Uh, so that would mean those employees, for whatever months, that certain employees receive coverage that didn't provide, you know, minimum value or affordability. Uh, there might be very, there could be various reasons that it, you know, doesn't didn't apply all year or to all employees. Um, but you know, for I could give you an easy example where it might apply to apply to some, but not all. Uh, whereas you know, you have you know higher earners uh, who you know are meeting the affordability test, but you have lower earners where the you know, low, where the lowest uh, health plan is not meeting you know, affordability. So it's just going to be some uh, of your employees that you'd be penalized here. Um, but again, it, it, it can add up very, very quickly, um, you know, given that it's over $340 a month per employee. So, Brenda, I just want to kind of bring it, yep. bring it, uh, <laughs> I want to simplify this a whole bunch. So I'm guessing, I mean, I do this for a living. Uh, we talk this stuff every day and hearing you go through all this, this, this is just so complex. Um, uh, I, I suspect unless people are taking copious notes that they're, they're not going to walk away remembering every single dollar amount, every single fine um, and every single thing that they must comply with. Uh, but fair to say that, uh, the risk here for employers is if you do it wrong, you might be doing it wrong all year and uh, getting by just fine. It might not be an employee who, who like uh, an employee maybe making a, 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 you end up at a wage and hour audit with the Department of Labor because you got an employee that complains uh, for, for some reason. This, But you might file your 1095C, you're, you might file your taxes and your ACA 
filing appropriately. But if something, uh, if the if the numbers don't look right, it, it, you end up being audited. It's the retroactive danger here of doing it wrong that you can be lulled to sleep thinking you're doing this right for a long time, and the audit might reveal that you didn't do uh, uh, your summary of benefit coverage uh, in there. It's costing you 1,200 bucks per head. Uh, the audit might reveal that, uh, oh, you actually didn't have the details required in here uh, to do your, your, your safe harbor uh, calculation, uh, and here's $110 a day. The, the audit might reveal uh, your formulas are off for employer side contributions, et cetera. Uh, and I think the point that we just probably wanna drive home, and we're not trying to falsely scare anybody, but uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, ACA is just one of those areas that if you do it wrong, so it's binary, either you must comply or you don't have to comply. If you do have to comply, if you do it wrong, you get audited and, and, and found out for doing it wrong, it just gets really, really expensive really, really fast. Did, am I being melodramatic about this? No, no, I, I, look, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, it, it, the way you described it, yeah, I think it's like you're, you're sitting on a, uh, you know, a ticking time bomb and you don't know when it's, when it's going to blow. You know, these are things you'll file uh the irs will will get around to it eventually if there are uh you know if there are potential penalties and so um you know simply look the, the first aspect is you know give out the notices and do make the filings right Th that'll you know avoid any you know penalties there just you know with with what a large employer has to file and then yes then of course the actual coverage that you're providing needs to be compliant and so yeah, I, I think that it, it is more complicated, uh, you know, that, than many other, you know, compliance-related issues for employers. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think I would just suggest that employers not get lulled to sleep on this. That you know, with the thought that oh, my, my broker, you know, they, they've they've got this under control. Um, they they very well may and might be giving you you know all the things you need. But understanding the requirements, having a, an understanding of the framework that you're dealing with, uh, so that you know if there are changes in the plan, it, it, you know if there are things, you know, you have an understanding of at least you know what are some of the compliance issues. You know, are, are we still meeting affordability? Do we need to change you know our our safe harbor? You know, you might not have the answers, but if you know some of the questions to ask. Uh, and at least look into those that, you know, that that'll get you, you know, pretty far too. Right, right. But I, I'm going to pick that as a time to kind of kind of wrap for us here. So here's what, here's what I'd say. This is really, really complex. I think on the front end, your broker, your insurance broker can help you a ton. Part of the value that they provide is not just getting you good deals on insurance. Uh, certainly uh, that they can help consult and advise on putting together health insurance plans uh, and benefit plans that attract and retain talent, but they can also help you stay compliant with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, uh, you still have to file the 1095Cs if you're uh, uh, if you're uh, an applicable large employer, ALE, as Brian was calling them. Um, and so, with that, we have your payroll data as a as a payroll provider for for our clients. And so, filing these taxes, tax returns, and doing it accurately. Uh, is something we can do easily. If you don't have the data and you have to do this manually, this is super hard, super complex. Uh, you heard Brian just touching on some of the nuance that's involved for, for compliance and some of the data requirements. So if there's any way we can help around uh, uh, filing for uh, uh, the, 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 required, the required filings uh, for the Affordable Care Act, we would love to help. Brian, for those cases that get a little extra hairy uh, or where somebody truly needs legal advice, maybe around entity consolidation, et cetera. Can you just real briefly share what your firm does and how you could help? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so Jackson Lewis, uh, we are a uh, countrywide, nationwide uh, employment defense law firm. We, we represent businesses in anything having to do with uh, labor employment. Uh, and, and so like Mike said, you know, here with, with ACA, you know, you might get a, uh, a uh, penalty, there are, you know, filing and, and uh, appeal deadlines. Um, 
you know, or you know, a- anything else that that relates to to ACA, we might be able to help you with. And I, I would always say, Mike, I, I, I you know, absolutely, I, I would recommend you know people utilize the services of Assure in this process because there are you know a lot of uh, you know details that um, you know an organization like Assure is you know more capable at helping you with that than going at it alone and kind of on a, a wish and a prayer. Uh, so that, that would be highly recommended. I appreciate it, Brian. If there's anything we can do to help anybody around payroll, tax, human resources, time to tenants, or HR services, we would love to help. And with that, Brian, thanks for joining me today. I always learn something every time I talk to you. Yep. Thanks for having me, Mike. And thanks to everyone else for enjoying, uh, joining us today. We will talk to you next week. Thanks.